In my last video I discussed anaphoras and what I consider to be their musical equivalents. Keep in mind this is part two of a continuing series on rhetoric and music, so if you haven't seen part one, I'd highly recommend you watch that first. I will now be continuing the topic of rhetoric with a very similar example of rhetorical repetition known as the epiphora. An epiphora is the exact opposite of an anaphora, as it constitutes the repetition of a word or phrase at the end of every clause. A famous example of this comes from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Another example comes from the oath performed daily in American courtrooms. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth? Huh? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth? You might notice that this is a very emphatic device as the emphasis is placed on the last word or words of a clause. I feel the same emphatic nature is also heard in music that uses repetitions at the end of musical phrases. So let's take a look at some musical examples of this in action. First, we'll look at this very compact example from the presto of Bach's violin sonata in G minor. In contrast to the anaphora, the repetition comes continuously at the end of each tiny musical clause. But you may also notice that the material before each epiphora can also be considered a melodic anaphora, that is sequentially modified with each repetition. Another example is found in the first movement of Mozart's violin sonata in E minor. Repetition is obviously melodically altered, but constitutes a repetition nonetheless. And as I showed with the musical anaphoras in my last video, a musical epiphora can also be rhythmic in nature. Let's see this in action with this simple example from the first minuet from Bach's third violin partita. Here it is not the notes themselves that represent the epiphora, but the repetition of the quarter note pattern from the first musical clause. This shows how a clever composer such as Bach can imply repetition without necessarily repeating the same sequence of notes or harmonies. Let's continue with this section from Mozart's Dies Irae from his Requiem. As you can see, this shows how rhetorical devices can be woven into the tapestry of orchestration. This repeated rhythm played by the brass actually serves a rhetorical purpose, as it fills the vacancy left by the momentary absence of the choir. But this also shows Mozart's intimate understanding of orchestration. Brass instruments can often drown out the orchestra and even a choir, so strategically placing this brass rhythm after the choir has essentially finished singing each clause, he fills the void but also manages to achieve a much thicker, but at the same time clearer, musical sound as a result. We can analyze this even further and recognize that this simple repeated brass rhythm is almost a response to the rhetoric of the liturgical text itself. This once again shows a simple liturgical example of an anaphora with the repetition of the Latin dies for day. Mozart rounds out each clause with a musical epiphora, thus creating a sonic atmosphere befitting of the day of reckoning that this piece is conveying. There is a reason this is perhaps one of the most famous requiems ever written. You might not hear the intricacies of its musical perfection, but your brain almost certainly does at a subconscious level. In the next part, we will be looking at rhetorical devices that pertain to consecutive repetition, whereby literary and musical repetitions are not divided by differing or varied material, but immediately restated.
You might be surprised to discover that not all adjacent repetitions are created equal, so stay tuned.